Good day, uh, CFO Club listeners. My name is Nicholas van Wyk. I'm the CEO of SIBA, the Chartered Institute for Business Accountants, and also editor for CFO Club. Uh, and today we're hosting a very interesting presenter and speaker. I follow him on LinkedIn, and this is also how we connected. Uh, his name is Chris Hutton. He's the executive director uh, from the uh, Center for Risk Analysis. And um, we usually on CFO Club speak with CFOs. We cover their careers, how they, what they studied, what type of experience they gained, and what is their role and function of the modern CFO. Uh, and uh, which is quite useful because it gives you a benchmarking. Um, and also for potential CFOs, it, it gives them a route to become a CFO. And then we discuss many things eh, in the life of the CFO. But a CFO works within a country in on a continent eh, in an economy and uh, for a company in a province uh, and they um because they're now on the boardroom and they're dealing with the ceo and they have to go to the agm they have to understand what uh, is impacting their results so it might not be something that the company is doing uh, it might be something external like some government official being elected because he's popular or she's popular ending up in uh, parliament and then making making policy decisions, and um, I sometimes wonder how well they actually understand the um, the sector in which they operate or they're responsible for the dynamics. Uh, certainly, from my point of view. And I recently read a report from McKinsey on Africa, um, giving a kind of a very hopeful picture about Africa uh, by 2035. Apparently, we'll have the largest working population in, in the world will also be the youngest uh, population uh, of all continents uh, and um, there's still a huge untapped potential. Uh, new cities are being created in Africa, uh, there's uh, infrastructure developments needed, a whole bunch of energy sources must be found to, to power up this growth uh, and that's why we then thought to in invite Chris Hutton to come and present and speak with us at CFO Club uh, and guide our CFOs in navigating the African future, um, which um, yeah, hopefully will dominate the world quite soon uh, on economic growth. So CFO Club, those of you that's not familiar with us, we started in 2000, uh, 2016, uh, where SIBA uh, launched a new designation for CFOs, and that was to address the gap where a person would qualify as a CASA uh, and then undergo some more experience and training with corporates in the different areas of financial management. It takes about eight to ten additional years and some somewhere in between there there's an uh, MBA qualification. So when a person then adds a CTA qualification or CA uh, plus an MBA, then he is now groomed to become or she is now groomed to become a certified financial officer CFO SA. And this designation uh, and the skill sets for that is also now being considered by the European Union um, to kind of standardize the skill sets uh, it, it, uh, globally so that, they, so that the CFOs can um, yeah, work, work across borders. And if you want to know more and about this, please go to the CFO Club website, cfoclub.co.za. It's a brand of CIBA, the Chartered Institute of Business Accountants, and we cover quite in-depth articles about the role of the CFO, uh, what it means with to be a steward, a, a um, catalyst, an operator, and a strategist. And then obviously we interview in interesting people. Like today we're interviewing Chris Hutton. Uh, he is the executive director for the Center of Risk Analysis. I was just on his LinkedIn profile again, and I can recommend that the listeners go to his LinkedIn profile. There's a wealth of posts uh, and information that he shares. Um, and he has a very long history in, in policy development. And I would also like him to explain policy development and the importance they have to, to have uh, this skill set. I see Chris worked for the Free Market Foundation uh, for a number of years and then with as deputy head of campaigns with South African Institute of Race Relations. And then he started with the Center for Risk Analysis, head of policy and eventually the executive director. Uh, and uh, Chris, I uh, recently read a post that you made, I think I might have heard you on a radio interview, about infrastructure uh, and, and water 
and, and that's some of the things we'll be discussing. But but let's start at the, at the beginning. Tell us a bit about yourself, your development, and what you're currently doing. Uh, good day, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me onto this this platform. I hope we we can have an engaging and thought provoking uh, discussion. Thanks for the the shout out for my my LinkedIn page as well. Um, if people would like to go and follow, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of content. So I'm hoping that most of it, if not all of it, is is useful for uh, various individuals and businesses across South Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And just a little bit on, on myself and on the, the center. So I, I studied uh, philosophy at uh, Rhodes University and the University of Stellenbosch. I have my uh, MPhil in business ethics from Stellenbosch University. So more on the sort of analytical uh, macro side of of academic things and um, as I've been working at the center for a few years now we're trying to combine that with economic analysis uh, scenario planning and elements of forecasting um, in my work at the center I, I have the privilege I should say of getting to to read a lot a lot of government documents uh, political party documents policy briefs all that sort of thing along with the usual um, content that one gets from various news Public publications and platforms such as uh, Business Day locally, but also internationally, entities like The Economist, Bloomberg, and others uh, trying to get as much information into, into our heads as analysts as possible. And from that, synthesizing and summarizing the information, uh, connecting, connecting the dots between things, uh, between economics and politics. Um, we also try and uh, think of our day-to-day -day work as connecting what what is on the front pages so the headlines in newspapers to what's happening in the on the business pages so nothing happens in a vacuum um, economic growth uh, investment decisions all of that is is made in the context of certain policy choices um, and in south africa's case we've of course had our latest elections um, our, our 2024 national and provincial elections and all of the policy decisions we see now coming from the new government of national unity are made within the context of those election outcomes. So we try and uh, connect all these things for our clients. Uh, we provide uh, weekly risk alerts and reports uh, to our clients. We provide uh, bespoke briefings as well as other um, reports on the state of the economy um, and politics in, in South Africa. So it seems that we, as we engage with um, local local stakeholders, that there's very little policy coordination or understanding of, of general policy. And then I was wondering, if this is happening at the local level, how does this play out na provincially and nationally? And then even if I think about our uh, President Ramaphosa, whether he has a policy team and, and how they go about looking at South Africa as an economy and then using experts like yourself. Uh, to coordinate that policy, uh, let alone get everybody to act in the same way. Chris, your comments on that? So I think I think what you highlight is um, <laughs> is especially a big challenge given the social and economic problems that continue to plague South Africa. Because then you have even more stakeholders, people who want to be involved in the solutions in the policy making. You have lots of voices clamoring uh, to be heard. So to try and, I guess, synthesize these as best as possible is a challenge. I think the best example maybe of what President Ramaphosa in his previous administration did was Operation Vulandlela, uh, where there are certain focus areas um, and these work streams between uh, government and, or, and, and organized business, so for example, energy, logistics, and crime, and that you then try and focus the time, the resources, the policy formulations into some of those areas. So that then filters into leg legislation. Where do we need to implement reforms in terms of legislation? Uh, where do new new acts, um, so new forms of legislation need to be introduced? Or where can you amend previous ones? And that, of course, then has implications for things like your state and entities. Uh, do you need new ministers who are involved in those departments and with those said state-owned entities? Um, who do you give the sort of oversight to? So here you saw a challenge, for example, between uh, Minister Mantashe and the new Minister of Electricity. At that time, 
Minister Ramakhopa. Um, Minister Ramakhopa now has sole oversight electricity, but of course, uh, energy and mineral resources were were combined together. They were under the purview of Minister Montashe. So you've got your your sort of plans. Then, as the president, you also then need to decide who exactly has oversight uh, over what. And then in the process of formulating either new legislation or amendments, you open up those proposals to public input and public comments. We've seen this, maybe the best example is iterations of that in the national health insurance, various forms of which have been proposed over many years now, probably over about 10 years, if not longer. But then you had green papers, white papers, you had the formulation of the NHI Act, um, you had the opening up of um, processes for the public to provide input, either written or in oral submissions. You had uh, hearings and sittings uh, in Parliament and various portfolio committees and the implications. So policy formation takes, I think, quite a substantial amount of time. And when you have pressures on the government through things like a 33% unemployment rate, a 74% youth unemployment rate, uh, GDP growth since 2012, which has averaged 0.8% per year. That that makes it all the more, more urgent to maybe cut through and focus on core policy um, sort of uh, priorities to make sure that you aren't just caught up in, in workshops and talking around the whole time where everyone agrees on the problems. But ultimately, who does it come down to to ensure implementation is is done? Uh, a further wrinkle in the South African context is for the African National Congress, which was the majority party above 50 percent uh, throughout the country's democratic history since 1994. Uh, it could become a bit more of an echo chamber. So you, you sort of talk to your colleagues who agree on ideology and policy um, and you, you decide to implement certain ideas. The outcomes are not what you maybe intended or wanted, wanted, but nonetheless, um, you're maybe a bit uh, immune to criticism. Uh, you don't get that necessary feedback mechanism from society. So that's another wrinkle that South Africa has had to contend with, and that could now be changing now that you have the ANC drop into below 50% and having to form a government of national unity where you've got parties who are not, not to you know, say that they're going to agree on everything. There are strong ideological issues on which they disagree. But there is now space for discussion and different feedback and pushing back and compromise. It just opens up a bit more space for policy formation to maybe breathe a bit more, for new ideas to come in more so than had been the case before 2024. Yeah, so I think um, what you're saying is we should have had a little bit more appreciation for for our politicians, for our um, officials working for the state. It, it is a it is a very cumbersome process, and there's so many voices, like you said, and you're working in a very difficult economic uh, situation in South Africa. Uh, sometimes I do wonder um, if we uh, maybe on top of policy whether there's a a vision for the country. Like, what type of nation and what economic impact do we, as a as a country, want to play in the world? Uh, I sometimes read Janet Yellen's. I think she's the Secretary of State. I'm not too sure, but from the U.S. Uh, when when she writes her, some of her uh, letters or decisions, it's all available on their on their websites. Then you can see a very clear intent about a, a nation that believes it should be dominant in, in the world, it should set the standards. And then there's these meetings with the different sectors in society and then everybody falls in place and then the officials have to follow that decision or policy. Something similar um, I saw in India recently when I attended an international conference for accountants. Uh, it was 6,000 people attending part of an IFAC World Congress, like the Olympics for accounting every four years. And um, last year it was hosted in India. But what stood out for me was the total focus. Um, it's like a national identity mm -hmm. on GDP. Um, a, a minister official opened the event and started talking about GDP. Um, afterwards, there were some actors, uh, famous, famous people in India, and instead of talking about their acting careers, they started talking about GDP. 
And then after that, there was even a, a yogi master uh, explaining to us um, what they do. Uh, but his, his whole, all his exercises that he did uh, to get um, yourself coordinated within yourself, your internal and external being, and, and that's, that's what they do, was to say, but I, we need to do this because we need to increase GDP. And yeah, as I visited the exhibitors, and there were hundreds of them, and, and large numbers of accountants, and everybody just saying, we need to increase India's GDP within the next 18 months with a trillion dollars. So that's just like a huge, strange target or ob objective that you set yourself. But coming back home to, to South Africa, there are such things as the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreements, and we have the African Union. We, we see the need for infrastructure development, huge, huge infrastructure development. Um, but, but in this whole revitalization of Africa, do you think that Africa is in a good position to, to still play a leading role? Uh, we used to be the, the largest economy, um, still have the most uh, millionaires and billionaires, and most of the uh, companies with a billion uh, dollar turnover is still, I think, 40% of all the companies in Africa. I think there's about 350 or so companies with, with that size turnover, and 40% of them are here. But there are uh, countries in Africa with much stronger GDP growth, coming from a low base, it's true. But I'm always just thinking, uh, if you don't keep on having that leading role in Africa, then, then capital and money flows elsewhere. And as we struggle to f figure out our energy um, needs uh, and our infrastructure, we, we might uh, risk losing our, our leading status in Africa. And, and what would that mean for CFOs and, and moving their companies abroad? Uh, just your thoughts on how policy can be used to position a nation's rank or position within the global community and how we compete with other nations and I just want, need to make sure everybody understands that we are competing with other nations. It's not like it's a, it, everybody wants to see us being successful. Um, it, it's a competing between nations that, that we face and yeah, I, I think I made my, my point clear. Just your views on that. So I think two things to keep in mind. Number one, with, with policy and policy formation. Um, when there is more uncertainty for, for domestic businesses, for domestic investors, for professionals um, across various industries and sectors, when there's policy uncertainty, um, when, when a government talks about radical reforms, either for the positive or the negative, but it's not clear about how it's going to be done, maybe it'll be done in a reckless manner, not a sort of systematic manner. All of that serves to increase uncertainty for investors and capital. And when, when you raise the, the uncertainty for capital, it's not, it's not a guarantee that it will go elsewhere, but you just increase, you disincentivize capital from forming in your given country, whether it's from domestic or, or foreign sources. Now, every country has a risk as a sort of risk profile um, that that particular government uh, government's bonds carry a certain level of risk so south african bonds for example have been and south africa's risk premium has been uh, relatively more elevated the last few years and part of that has reflected policy uncertainty um, the the most recent example of this is around the national health insurance uh, where feedback from medical professionals, from think tanks, researchers, um, citizens, many stakeholders, medical aides, has been a support for the concept of universal health co coverage, but not the NHI as it is currently formulated. And concerns expressed that the act was signed into law before the elections. And now you have, for example, the, the new uh, Minister of Health Dr. Aaron Motswaledi, he was in the position uh, a few years ago and then went to, to Home Affairs, but he is back now uh, at the Department of, of Health, uh, saying, for example, uh, that the government will pursue the NHI even if it comes at the cost of the government of national unity. Now, uh, he might very well believe that, but the sort of those sorts of comments feed into that, er, that area of policy uncertainty and that policy is going to be pursued almost regardless of some of the signals that are received from business, 
from from uh, those professionals who have to implement these policies and ideas and legislation uh, it sends the wrong sort of signal um, at the moment in the global context when you have capital that is a little bit more risk averse a little bit more skittish um, you have the possibility still that the us could go into recession i think that has receded it's not a guarantee that the that the us fed is going to execute the so-called soft landing um, with interest rates and all of that 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 implies but as global capital and investors are a bit more skittish and uncertain for you as a country the sort of signals you send around the policy new policy ideas that you're going to implement or how you take on board um, proposals around how you reform current policies I think is very important and for South Africa given that it is still I think one of if not the on some metrics um, economic powerhouse on the continent a lot of infrastructure stock uh, very highly developed and complex financial markets and the finance the finances sector uh, in general stands out if you look at all those things that South Africa has to its advantage, when you get some of those basics around policy rights, the sort of wins that you can get from that, I think are quite quite remarkable, especially as the developed world, the so-called developed world, countries like the US, uh, Canada, in Europe, um, they're running into a bit more of a difficult uh, growth situation at the moment. You have um, tensions in terms of global trade, more geopolitical tensions between the US and China especially, but also uh, between European countries and Russia with the continued conflict in Ukraine. Uh, you have just a conflict in the Middle East that is deeply affecting not, of course, just people, only people living there, but also trade that has to flow through the Middle East. All of that could set South Africa up quite well to be one of those countries, for example, that is implementing the Africa free trade area that is a beacon for policy stability, governance stability, that, that will attract more capital. So I think if we get some of the basics right around governance, uh, how we change policy, uh, we, it seems like we've got our electricity situation under control. Can we now get logistics on the right sort of track as well? That puts us in a very strong position in the sort of medium to longer term. Uh, especially driving growth in the sub-Saharan African region, uh, where I think through through sort of 2030, sub-Saharan Africa could average around 4% growth on the best case scenario, where countries like the US and in Europe might only average below 2% growth. Um, and that, that bodes well, I think, for, for the subcontinent's uh, prospects. Mm. Uh, I, can't, I totally agree with you. Um, we, we are in a very good position in South Africa with our network of, of roads and, and, and infrastructure and, the, like you said, financial services. And you're right, if we can just get that policy right, then there would be dramatic uh, changes. Uh, I once read that every 1% in GDP increase, and I know it's difficult to, to actually make it a science calculation, but would decrease uh, poverty levels with like 2.5%. And um, so, so GDP is such an important uh, indicator for a country. Um, but speaking now specifically on the post that I read about your views on, on infrastructure and then specifically, or, or rather transport, uh, Transnet, uh, and I also saw some posts uh, lately about the water situation and the water councils and not, uh, water not being, um, well, they're not paying their fees and such. Um, what is the underlying uh, issues with our with Transnet. Uh, there has been some positive signs lately uh, that it seems that they can change it around. Uh, but we really talk about billions and billions of, of, of investments that has, has been made in them. Um, yeah, just your insights for our CFO community on, on Transnet and whether they will be able to sort out their issues and then also the water situation. So on Transnet, um, I think so the biggest win right now is the clearing of lots of, of, of the backlogs of container ships uh, at the countries, at two of the country's biggest harbors, indeed two of the biggest harbors on the continent, those being in Cape Town and in Durban. So at the end of 2023, um, if listeners, some, some listeners would have um, seen uh, pictures on social media or they might have been maybe on holiday uh, in, in Durban 
um, and would have seen the, the long queues of container ships waiting to offload their containers due to a lack of equipment at Durban Harbour, lack of cranes uh, in the case of Cape Town. It seems like the majority of those backlogs have been cleared. Now, you still have a, a big challenge in terms of uh, digital digitalization. Um, so, unfortunately, at many of our ports, if not most of them, it's an issue of having to deal with lots of paperwork instead of digital processes being as optimized and streamlined as possible. That causes delays uh, when you have a lack of space, just you know, basic sort of infrastructure, lack of space for trucks to get in, to get those containers off the ships and get them out, um, sort of having staging areas where you could store containers, uh, brackets for trucks onto which the containers are loaded. And of course, in the case of city of Cape Town, where you have uh, more disruptive weather patterns over the last sort of year. Now, no one can control the weather, uh, but you can ensure that you have the sort of equipment uh, and space that you need as an international port uh, to eliminate as much downtime as possible. The longer it takes for shipping companies, uh, for importers and exporters to get their, their goods, their materials onto ships and out of South Africa, or the longer it takes them to get those uh, things into the country, uh, the higher the costs for them uh, in terms of time, in terms of fuel, um, security concerns, as well as I mentioned around uh, the Middle East in Yemen, where uh, Houthi rebels in Yemen have been attacking container ships now since October of last year and continue to do so. All of that adds to your risk as a, a company that is involved in the logistics space. And South Africa has lost out some, some market share. I don't think it's that big just yet, but we have seen some shifting trade patterns where both South African exporters, especially in things like agriculture, but also in some importers have shifted some of their trade flows to countries in Namibia, such as Namibia and Mozambique. Now, um, it, it, of course, that adds travel time and costs in terms of then having to move your goods across a road uh, and South Africa's roads, but you don't have to wait as long as you might have had to wait to get your goods um, through the harbors and the ports in Cape Town and Durban. So just something longer term to keep in mind. South Africa is still, I think, one of the, the countries with the biggest trade impact on the continent. But when those trade relationships and that sort of that stability or predictability about you as a country and your trade infrastructure, when that declines and companies shift some of their uh, trade operations to other countries, it's no guarantee that you're going to get them back in the future. You can do so if you improve your operations, if South Africa's ports can, if the, if the ports rise up the rankings of the World Bank, um, but it should not be assumed that it will always uh, uh, come back. Uh, at the moment, the current uh, sort of state of health of Transnet specifically, uh, on the 2nd of September, we had the latest financials uh, revealed and Transnet reported a loss of 7.3 billion rand during the year ended March 2024. Uh, this was bigger than the 5 billion rand loss it penciled in during the corresponding period in 2023. It's also the second successive year that Transnet has lost money. Now, it's important to highlight that there were some, some court cases involved in this regard, some payments that Transnet had to make uh, that increased that loss. Uh, but this is also tied to the difficulty Transnet is encountering in terms of moving volumes of goods. So, for example, through the year ended uh, 31st of March this year, Transnet moved 151.7 million tons of goods. And that was a 1.5% increase in the previous year. However, uh, the logistics recovery plan that is set for Transnet by government uh, that commits Transnet to achieving 154.4 million tons. So Transnet reaching 151 and the target is 154. So just a little bit behind target. So I think it shows you that Transnet is moving volumes, uh, maybe not to the specific target, but as hopefully it starts to uh, get some of its rolling stock back, uh, back online, as it were, as it gets a handle on cable theft, on derailments, um, on other infrastructure issues, 
and also as it gets some private sector companies involved in some of the harbors, especially uh, Durban Harbor, which is the country's most important in terms of volume, then possibly it can start to move even more volumes and that will help its balance sheet. Um, it has to deal with a lot of debt. Uh, it was afforded a, a sort of debt uh, relief coverage by Treasury. It's not a direct loan. Um, it's almost like a bit of a security in a way. So it gives Transnet a bit more breathing room. But Transnet needs to use that, I think, very quickly. Um, the, the debt, I think, concern is quite big. At the moment, its, it's debt sits at 137.7 billion rand. That's up from 130 billion in 2023. And of course, for you as a company, the more debt you need to deal with and repay, um, that makes it more difficult for you to spend on actual capital expenditure, on salaries, on the things that you need to run the company day to day. So a bit of a transnet with a bit of a balancing act at the moment. I think it's doing what it can with what it has. I think the new CEO, uh, Michelle Phillips, she's uh, she's really sort of seized the, taken the bull by the horns and, and sent very good messages and her engagements with business and, uh, and sort of um, stakeholders in general has been very good. But there's a, I think there's a substantial challenge ahead for, for Transnet. Yeah, interesting comments. Uh, it, it doesn't sound as if those, the, the challenges that they have been experiencing uh, is, uh, is, is, they seem like they just run of the mill things. They, the size mm -hmm. of the port, the abilities, more cranes. Um, and it's, I don't know whether it's a, just a, a general feeling of being lackluster or just willing to be average. Um, and, I, and when I say this, I speak generally about business, uh, not just Transnet. Um, I find that within our own organization, if we set big goals for ourselves, like really, really stretched targets, it, it changes things. It, it motivates staff members and it changes the way we think about things, how we innovate, how we plan. Uh, and if us as an organization compare ourselves to local, other local professional bodies, then that kind of limits our thinking. But if you compare yourself to, to Africa and more globally, the U.S., you suddenly realize how far you still have to go. So you're never satisfied with yourself. You're never satisfied with the finished product. And you and you start to planning a little longer term. So um, I was just wondering whether our state-owned entities are setting their targets too low. Um, I see the news and I see how, Africa, uh, how China is supporting Africa, building roads, building infrastructure, uh, building railways. And then I'm thinking, but, but why isn't South Africa building those? Um, we, we, we're trying to fix something that's, that's not particularly complex in, in, on world affairs. If you, I watch these programs on TV and then I can't believe how, how, many, how much things China is building, how many cities, how many roads, how many of everything. Uh, just expanding and growing. And then I'm thinking, and we're struggling with one or two extra cranes. So I don't know whether it's, a, it's the way we compare ourselves and, and how we view ourselves in the world. Um, uh, and that's the first question. And the second one is, um, it has serious implications for business if, if Transnet can't sort out their affairs because then businesses can't grow, they can't deliver their products, there's uncertainty. They might sit on capital that they would otherwise have been expensing. They, they won't employ more people. Uh, just, just relate to us that connection between the work that state-owned entities have to do uh, and the effect it has on the private sector. And then secondly, the idea of setting bigger goals rather than just trying to fix uh, something that's, that's uh, of a problem uh, uh, in the current uh, scenario. Sure. So just on the on the state owned entities, if, if you've got entities like Transnet and ESCOM that through legislation and, and previous government's decisions were afforded effectively monopoly status in their sectors, in this case, electricity and logistics, two areas that if they don't function, you don't you don't you don't have manufacturing capacity in your country, you don't have construction. Uh, you don't have serious levels of fixed capital formation. Uh, when I talk about fixed capital, I mean you know things like roads, bridges, mine shafts, uh, heavy plant equipment, all that sort of stuff that that indicates a bit more 
a willingness to to invest hard capital uh, in a given country uh, if those state-owned entities on whom so much pressure and responsibility has been placed and definitely a form of concentration risk when they fail the added costs and barriers added to businesses just mount uh, sort of day to day week after week month after month where if escom isn't keeping the lights on for you as a business you need to try and for example now then pay more for petrol um, if you can't keep your lights on be safe and you need to pay more security um, the issue with security we've seen with the south african police service where if you've got a decline in capability on the part of the police but also on the part of citizens a declining trust uh, in police and in the government uh, you then try and um, employ a private security company and of course not every south african um, can afford various forms of private service delivery so electricity uh, water security and safety that means for many south africans they're exposed to more crime uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and that in turn then impacts broader economic activity um, prospects for job creation etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, when you've got your SOEs like ESCOM and Transnet failing, um, or, or, you know, sort of, I guess, if one is being kind, struggling on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, some bigger companies and corporates, uh, manufacturers, they can deal with those additional costs, but for many others, they can't. Um, f we talk about um, creating an, an enabling economy and environment where there can be new emerging farmers, um, businesses across the logistics space, you increase the prohibitively the costs for them to enter those sectors so much that you shouldn't be surprised when you don't see new market entrants. And when you don't see current um, businesses in those sectors being willing to employ more people because of the additional costs and the risk that would, that would take for them. They're not sure if they need to then spend more because we go to stage eight or nine of, of load shedding so uh, i think we're we're seeing elements of pragmatism creeping in now for the government um, and especially for um for the anc uh, who as i mentioned up until this year's elections was the only party above 50 percent and has now now dropped in in the polls where there's still a, a desire to want to maintain soes and have them play an important role but how can they be rejigged or reformed and uh, and also in terms of legislation in areas like electricity and logistics how can you open up space for private sector competition this is not to say that the private sector can solve all the problems on its own um, or that we should not try and get these soes and the, the government in general on a more healthy footing um, i don't want to dismiss that at all and just say we can sort of um, go around these issues uh, the whole time uh, if you really want a growing economy i think you need to capacitate the state uh, as best as as you can so those are just some of the implications of when your your soes your government departments don't function just makes it general very very in general very difficult for economic activity business activity to sort of take off um, and then on the point around um setting maybe bigger goals or ambitions I, I yeah i don't think there's any reason why south africa shouldn't set very high targets and very high goals from a sort of national level but also individual businesses individual households um, civil society uh, there's an opportunity there to not wait for the state to sort of set the target but to see what you can do as a business as an individual on a day-to-day -day basis to push things in a positive uh, direction i think we Maybe the best example of uh, one of the better examples of what South Africans can achieve when they work together uh, has been the Springboks, uh, where you have Sia Kulisi as the captain, you have Rossi Erasmus as the coach. Um, but just because everyone comes to the table with different skill sets, they play different positions, I think, from people like, like Rossi and from Sia. The, the standards that they set to their teammates and their colleagues, I think, are of the highest standards in the world. And that's why the, why the team performs that well. That's how you win back-to-back -back World Cups. You don't win that sort of thing without getting the organizational culture right, without setting 
stretch goals and very high targets. That sort of thing doesn't happen if you don't have the broad vision that motivates you. And the way to achieve that, that broad vision is to then make sure you do the very hard work day to day in things like training, et cetera. It's not very, it's not very sexy work or exciting work. And I think this is the case for the government as well. Um, you have to focus on getting those basics right in day to day governance. Without the basics, the broad vision and things like that, I think don't don't happen. Um, it's very difficult work. <laughs> it might not get one excited every day, but without that work, you don't get those long term goals that you that you say you want to achieve. I think. No, I, I totally agree with you, and I think South Africa is in a very good position to take uh, charge and lead the Africa Renaissance. Um, Africa is going to be the continent with with um, the highest potential, uh, but it's just small things that we need to align to get this right. Um, and the current, uh, well, it's changing now, but policy decisions has an impact on the economic life of citizens. Uh, I compare it to like walking through mud. Now you can live your life struggling just to go forward, or you can be, or not. You can, you, but it's a, it's a choice that you have to make, and then you have to uh, create the right policies and and get the right goals. Uh, we don't have to struggle so much. Um, uh, that sometimes I, I think that um, we made it a religion to, to, to decide that we struggling is good because it, it indicates something. But I don't think it is. Uh, struggling in the right direction is the good uh, approach. And, and that is to, to make life better for the future generations and be the leading nation in, in Africa. Uh, just on concluding our conversation, we always ask our audience, uh, a book recommendation. This can either be a business book or something that, that um, on a more personal level that, that gave you more insights into life or business. Can you share with us a, a book recommendation and, and why you would recommend this book? Um, I think the main one that jumps to mind is a book by a professor at the University of Stellenbosch, uh, Professor Hugh Hanfuri, and the book is entitled um, our our long walk to economic freedom and this book came out a, a few years ago of course it is a reference uh, to um, what former president Nelson Mandela talked about and also wrote about extensively uh, in terms of the long walk to freedom his own but also the country's uh, long walk to freedom until uh, 1994 and of course then the last two to three two to three decades. So Professor Fari, the reason why I, I recommend it and, and think it's useful, I mean, every day we we read so much and we encounter so much and maybe we lose sight of long term trends. And in my work at the center, um, but also in terms of my own sort of trying to understand society and economics and the world uh, around me is trying to identify long term trends. So how things aren't just in isolation, but making sense of how things are are connected together. And in this book, uh, Professor Fari traces throughout 100,000 years of human history, various examples of how sort of economic activity and economic freedom has developed. Um, there's lots of um, very interesting anecdotes. Uh, for example, how could a movie embarrass Stalin? Why, the, why do the Japanese play rugby? Uh, what do an Indonesian volcano Frankenstein and Shaka Zulu have in common. So if you if you want to read something, I think a little bit different that helps you think of a little bit differently about the world, um, how much progress humanity has made. It's not uh, dismissing the challenges that that many people around the world are still faced with, but I think it helps one to to read this sort of thing and just make sense of where people have come from and the potential for us uh, going forward. Thank you for that insight, and it's always nice to know that there are people like you and looking at policy, trying to make sense of it, and being able to advise companies on, on developments so that they can structure their uh, investment decision better. And also people uh, like the professor writing that book, no, thinking about uh, having a better South Africa for, for everyone. Chris, it was nice uh, hosting you on our CFO club. I'm sure we'll uh, have a discussion in the future again. Um, and also thank you to the audience for listening to us. Uh, and just some, uh, one closing remark from you, Chris, and then we'll end uh, uh, our podcast. 
Um, thanks, Nicholas. Thanks very much once again for the for the opportunity and to everyone who who joined our conversation today. I think um, yeah, the country has has lots of potential. Um, appreciate the moment in which we are. Um, after our elections that we have, we continue to have democratic and free elections. Um, there will be some bumps along the road, but I think there are lots of opportunities for businesses in various guises, including uh, people li who listen to this this podcast, um, seizing the sort of moment that we now have in 2024, um, that we can set the country, I think, on a very good track. It, it does require sort of getting getting one's hands dirty and getting involved. And I think there are many ways for people to do that through civil society, through um, through politics, uh, through you know talking to those around you, your families, your people in your communities, your networks. I think um, there's lots of lots of opportunity for us to to shift not just sentiment for the country, uh, but to change the reality uh, as well. Thank you for that message of hope, and that concludes our podcast. You have done the work. You have earned the title. Now get the designation. Cyber's most sought after CFO SA designation gives you the credibility and objective recognition of the 34 competencies that you've mastered on your route to becoming a CFO. Cyber's most sought after CFO designation gave me the credibility and objective recognition of the 34 competencies that I have mastered on my route grounded in an internationally recognized competency framework requiring knowledge and experience in strategy, operations and finance. Being part of the CFO Club Africa opens you up to a network of CFOs. The CFO SA designation is relevant to you if you have experience in performing various finance executive functions within the finance department. Being part of this elite group of modern CFOs helps you grow alongside your peers in a valuable source of advice on leadership challenges. If you are looking to demonstrate your leadership abilities to the future employers, then this designation is for you. Apply now. It's time to step it up. Become a finance leader and get recognized as a CFO. This is your cyber.